Uh, good afternoon. Um, first off, I'm very grateful to Brian and Sharon and for the Committee of Overcare for inviting me to speak. Um, so, is that any better? Yeah. So, I'm sorry, Dr. Sharon. Um, following up from one of the themes of Anne's talks there, um, I'm a clinical nurse specialist in cancer genetics, and a lot of really what I do <coughs> is trying to hopefully translate relatively complex terms into a language that people can understand. So hopefully I can, I can achieve that um, this afternoon. Um, I usually like to start off with a, with a clinical case. Um, but in March 2014, um, Dr. Gallagher and I, we, we met a 27-year-old woman, uh, unaffected, but she was concerned about her family history of cancer. Um, so I suppose the, the first question um, most people ask is when you attend clinical, well, what is the likelihood that there is a hereditary predisposition in the family? And um, other questions is, you know, is it likely that I have a mutation? What is a mutation? And what is genetic testing? What does it entail? Uh, how long does it take? And who should consider it? And where and why? Um, but we know that the majority of all cancers are not hereditary. It's approximately 10% of all cancer, be it breast or ovarian or colorectal cancer, approximately 10% of it is hereditary. And what usually tells us is not the genetic test, it's usually the family history will usually tell us. Not always, but usually it does. And um, the history of the BRC1 or 2 genes, you know, you take the first two letters from breast, BR, and the first two letters from cancer, CA. So BRCA1 is the first gene identified over 21 years ago, and BRCA2 is the second one. But it's been known for well over 100 years that cancer, like certain conditions, runs in certain families. Paul Brock is a, a French neuropathologist, and he published a paper in 1866. Now, the reason he came out of his field of uh, uh, neuroanatomy to publish a ca paper on cancer genetics is that one of the women in this family he published was his wife and there was 10 cases of breast cancer over four generations. So that's the the first uh, known publication we think of that um, demonstrating a hereditary predisposition to cancer. Some key figures, I'll talk about Professor Henry Lynch on the right shortly of, of Lynch syndrome which also leads to an increased risk, lifetime risk of ovarian cancer. Um, but Professor Lynch was the first person to make the connection between a, an increased risk of breast cancer and an increased risk of ovarian cancer. And then Mary Claire, Claire King's group on the left hand side, they identified linkage or they identified the region on chromosome 13 which um, contains the BRCA1 gene in the early 1990s. Uh, closer to home, I was just very lucky. I was in the right place at the right time and Professor Peter Daly asked me to come and work with him um, in St. James's Hospital. And on the left is the um, paper published uh, over 21 years ago now, which identified the BRCA2 gene in a, in, that was driven largely by a large Irish family with a hereditary predisposition. Now, you can't see the details, but it's m there are multiple cases of, of early onset breast cancer, and there's a male breast cancer in that family. And that, that was the, ori and the original family with the BRCA2 mutation that Professor um, Daly and Will Mormerson and Ross McManus helped identify. But this is the, the tools of our trade. So the, us men are represented as squares and women are circles. So in terms of, as I said, it's the family tree that usually tells us most cancer is not hereditary. So you know, you usually have one woman with breast cancer and no one else affected and not at a, at a particular young age. If, if you have a common cancer like breast cancer in large families, the, the odds are good that you will see clustering of breast cancer in the family, but it's not likely to be hereditary. As in here, you know, you know, may, there may be low risk genes or environmental exposure or, and chance occurrence is also maybe a, a factor. But in hereditary predisposition to cancers, we, we tend to see strong family histories of early onset cancer, um, bilateral um, organs affected, um, evidence of a, of a pattern, of an autosomal dominant pattern where you can see a pattern being transmitted from parent to child over multiple generations. So these, these are the factors that make us suspect that there may be a BRCA1 or 2 mutation, as I said, early age of onset, 
multiple family members affected, bilateral organs, um, multiple tumours in the same individual, a particular pattern. It's a pattern in the family that we're looking for, an autosomal dominant pattern in the parents. And sometimes ethnicity is important. Um, people of Ashkenazi Jewish origin have a higher prevalence of three particular mutations. Um, and that, that's reflected in the criteria that we use for selecting people who may be eligible for genetic testing. As I said, it's, well, I didn't say, but genetic testing is time consuming and, and expensive. So there are criteria that we use to see, to establish well, who can qualify for BRCA1 or 2 testing. And this is the Manchester scoring system that was developed by um, uh, Professor Garrett Evans in um, the University of Manchester. Uh, it may not come across too well, but the, the, the criteria are weighted. So the earlier age of, of breast cancers generate a higher score. So the earlier case of breast cancer and cases of ovarian cancer and male breast cancer would score higher. So the, um, and if a person reaches a, a Manchester score of 16, it equates to a, an approximately a 10% chance of there being a BRCA1 or 2 mutation in the family. Um, uh, this uh, this 27 year old lady that we, we had seen, as you can see there she is there, she has a six month old daughter. Um, her mother was diagnosed with a high grade serious ovarian cancer at 52, her maternal aunt had breast cancer at 48 and she's alive well at 55. Uh, her niece is undergoing neoadjuvant uh, treatment for breast cancer at 31 and this lady, is her, her mother's maternal first cousin had a fallopian tube tumor diagnosed at 47 and has breast cancer at 60, you know. Um, so when we met this girl, you know, we said, well, that's, that's a very strong family history of cancer, you know. Um, but the, the question is, well, who is the best person to offer the genetic testing to? And certainly timing comes into it. We don't have to test everybody initially. You're, your, these genes are very large, um, but this, this girl's first cousin, she's undergoing neoadjuvant chemotherapy for early onset breast cancer, so timing is, is, is not appropriate here. But, you know, we can either test, you know, this lady's mother or her mother's first cousin. And I suppose some of the things that have changed over the, the last 20 years, or certainly in, since the 10 years since I started working with Professor Daly, when we start drawing our family tree, we just fill in the, uh, the patterns um, for early onset breast cancer and ovarian cancer. But now we're more, we're more interested in the actual subtype of ovarian cancer because um, there are certain subtypes like papillary serous ovarian cancer and fallopian tube tumors that make us more suspicious for a possible BRCA1 or 2 mutation. Um, but this is my job, which comes down to when I meet patients, is trying to translate um, jargon into a language that hopefully people can understand. And the, when you're talking about BRCA1 or 2 mutations, or hereditary predispositions in general, first words is penetrance. If I inherit the gene, what is my lifetime risk of developing cancer? Um, and certainly we know of say 100 women with a BRCA1 or 2 mutation, follow those 100 women up to age 70. On average, it may be 65, 70 of those women will develop cancer. But 25, 30% of women are born with a gene that confers a high lifetime risk of breast and ovarian cancer, but don't get cancer. Of course, the problem is we, we at the moment, can't tell us what's protecting that 25, 30% over the majority who develop cancer. The other, um, term to translate is variable expression, which means that if there's a BRCA1 or 2 mutation in the family, in the main among women who share that risk, it can cause breast cancer, it can cause bilateral breast cancer, it can cause breast and ovarian cancer, or the gene mightn't express itself at all, you know. Um, and you see these are, uh, these are the, the lifetime risks for, for breast cancer, for BRCA1 women, approximately 65%. And 45, or sorry, up to 40% lifetime risk of ovarian cancer for BRCA1, 11% for BRCA2, which are hugely increased lifetime risk if you compare that to the population risk of ovarian cancer. 
and this is the, the, the fundamentals of it. We said this, this woman, Circle, and this is her partner, they have a daughter. So these two um, square boxes here indicate that this woman has two copies of, say, just say it's a breast cancer gene, a BRCA2 gene. But her husband, he has one copy with a mutation, that's with the yellow, um, this kind of star there, and one normal copy. So their daughter, she can only inherit one normal copy from the mother, because the mother only has normal copies. But she has a one in two chance of inheriting the mutation, which she has here in this cartoon. But she has an equal 50-50 chance of not inheriting the, of inheriting the, the father's um, normal copy of the gene. Um, now, of course, this, 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 this child, this, this lady will run into problems if, for whatever reason, the other copy of the gene is, is, is knocked out in, this, in a particular cell. And the, um, the chance for developing a, a, a malignancy. Um, so uh, it just it reminds me, it's always important to know, it, it's, it's even, even to this day, we do see people in clinic and the occasional nurse and clinician who don't ask about the men in the family. Because men, very little breast tissue and don't have ovaries, so more likely than not, men are unaffected carriers of the BRCA1 or 2 gene in the family. So sometimes it can appear that we have a young woman in clinic who has a hereditary predisposition that seems to come out as blue. But, I mean, it, it's possible it could have arisen in over in that individual, but highly unlikely. Usually, it's been transmitted through the paternal line. And of course, there are three possible outcomes of genetic testing. You could identify a mutation. More often than not, the gene testing comes back negative, so it's usually black or white. Unfortunately, there's a gray area these genetic variants of uncertain significance. So if we do 100 tests a year, six times on a, of 100 approximately, the people in the lab will do some genetic testing and come back with a result and say, you know what, there is a change on this gene, but we don't know, does it lead to an increased risk of cancer or is it a red herring? Does it make the person unique? So those gray results can be very difficult to decipher because the patients say, well, does it lead to an increased risk of cancer or not? And we said, well, at the moment, we don't know. Back, um, back to our case, this, um, this lady, her mother's first cousin went for gene testing, was found to have a BRCA2 mutation. So now, now we have the answer. And now that you have the answer, knowledge is power, as we say in our clinic, is that it allows us, if there's a gene in the family, it allows us to see, well, who shares that gene and shares and has an increased lifetime risk and, and who doesn't. Um, so as you can see, not surprisingly, this patient's, uh, sorry, this lady's first cousin who had a papillary serous ovarian cancer, she was also a carrier, as was her niece um, who was, had, was on undergoing new adjuvant chemotherapy for breast cancer. But also, we, we test for the very same gene. So, you can see here that the, this lady's, the, the, the error for the lady with the fallopian tube cancer and the, the um, breast cancer at 60, as you can see, her mother died of old age and her sister, who's alive and well at 82 years of age now, they obviously have to share the gene. They have to, you know, they're obligate carriers. But here, as you can see, they didn't get cancer, you know. And as you can see then, the benefit of the knowledge is that subsequent generations, you can test them to see if they share that particular mutation. And um, individuals who don't can take a step back. They're likely at the population risk of breast cancer. So that's the fundamental benefit, really, of genetic testing is you have an answer. And then you can see, well, who else in the family shares that risk and needs to be screened, and who doesn't and take a step back. In, in, in terms of being screened in line with general population guidelines. Um, some of the barriers, um, a lot of people are wary of us in the genetic service. Um, somehow there's, there's a feeling there that if you confirm a mutation, if there's a result there in black and white, somehow it can worsen the prognosis. It's also commonly, people are very concerned about genetic testing in terms of the potential to discriminate themselves and their families in terms of 
um, health insurance or employment discrimination if I have the gene for X and I go for an interview and somehow it comes out that I've, I have that gene and maybe I won't get that promotion of that job. But the Disability, of, sorry, disability Act of 2005 prohibits one's employers and the health insurance companies from asking about genetic testing. Um, the, the fear of stigmatization, if I have a mutation, somehow I'm, I'm less worthy. Um, the fear of the preventative surgery and of a predetermined future. In terms of fears of the um, preventative surgery, we know that women who car carry breast cancer genes, um, breast screening, well, high-risk breast screening, annual mammography and annual breast MRI is as, is as effective as bilateral risk-reducing mastectomies. So uh, Dr. Gallagher and Professor Green, they're not going to come down and say to women, you should have bilateral mastectomies. Um, it's very much a personal choice over screening. But ovarian, you know, ovarian screening, you know, the evidence I don't think is there to suggest that it is effective. So for women who carry breast cancer genes, it's a reasonable thing for them to consider having their ovaries removed, um, obviously when their family is complete. And the reason's been, I won't hark on the point, but ovarian screening has its limitations. Um, women who carry breast cancer genes to have their ovaries out early reduce the risk of ovarian cancer as much as possible. And also, there's also a collateral breast cancer risk reduction benefit as well if the surgery, is, if the, surgery the ovarian risk reducing surgery is done before menopause. Um, a in 2011, I gave a talk similar to this at the Gary Kelly Foundation, and a, a young girl came up to me, she's 26, and said, you know, my mother had breast cancer 48. She said, I wonder do I have a, a hereditary predisposition? So I said, well, give me the details. She said, well, it was a triple negative breast cancer. And then her maternal grandmother died of a melanoma at 38. And outside of that, she had a maternal aunt, um, sorry, maternal uncle who had a bone tumor. Um, and I said, well, you know, yeah, triple negative breast cancer, you know, there is an association with uh, increased likelihood of being a BRCA carrier. But the family tree is small, and I said, look at your, your maternal grandmother. She was young to die of, of melanoma. Um, so I said, you know, it, it wouldn't be really unreasonable for your mother to have gene testing, because it is one of the limitations of this work that we do when you're looking at a family history. Adoption, false paternity, and increasingly the, the Irish families are getting smaller. And if you have families where there is way more men than women, this just happened by chance, you're not going to see a pattern there, because as I said earlier, men are much more likely to be unaffected carriers. Um, and then, of course, incomplete penetrance. You know, um, as I said, a, a percentage of women, maybe 25, 30% of women who carry breast cancer gene won't get car cancer. So sometimes that, um, you know, can make family trees less informative. But anyway, this lady, her, her mother came to see Dr. Gallagher and myself and was found to have a BRCA mutation. And then this girl who set the ball rolling, uh, 26, was found to be a, be a carrier. So, um, but w was empowered by the knowledge because knew that, well, she had to start breast screening with an annual mammography and annual MRI. And she knows that at some point in future when it's when her family is complete, it would be reasonable for her to consider having her ovaries removed. Um, so she went on high risk screening and had uh, an MRI in April 2012, clinical exam was defined, and then detected a, a breast lump later that year. It was nearly DCIS, so underwent bilateral risk reducing mastectomy. So, um, and thankfully, he's doing well um, ever since. And then, actually, the, when then, a, a few months later, then, she contacted me about the family history, said her mother was at a funeral, and it turned out, actually, there is a strong family history, but it's coming through her father's line. So, you know, family, I know this is a dr dramatic change in a, in a family history, you know. Um, but we do say to patients that we see in clinic is if, um, if we suspect that there isn't a, a strong evidence to suggest that there is a BRCA1 or 2 gene there that you know, we're not infallible, but if any changes in, in the family history to, to contact us and let us know and we can update the family history and, you know, revisit our assessment. Um, 
in terms of risk of hereditary risk of ovarian cancer, the other syndrome is Lynch syndrome after Henry Lynch. In Lynch syndrome, you tend to see a particular pattern of colorectal cancer in men and women, and cancer of the womb in women. They're the two sentinel cancers that you see in Lynch syndrome, but it's also an increased risk of gastric cancer and ovarian cancer, about an 11% lifetime risk. Um, and again, we were referred a lady with bilateral breast cancer at 44 and 49, and the request was, will you do BRC1 or 2 testing? Um, so when you draw the family tree out, um, her mother had endometrial cancer at 40, and colorectal cancer at 55, um, there's colorectal cancer here, and then a first cousin, colorectal cancer, endometrial cancer. So we said, that's, that's, a, Lynch, sorry, that's a Lynch syndrome family as opposed to a BRC1 or 2 family. So, um, we, we said we, this could take us time to get to the bottom in terms of doing genetic testing. So we advised this lady for all our siblings to have screening colonoscopies and then one of our sisters had a right-sided colorectal cancer diagnosed at 38. Um, so Lynch syndrome accounts for maybe three to five percent of all colorectal cancer. Um, again, autosomal dominant. Um, accounts for maybe five percent of all endometrial cancers as well. But you do see an increased risk of uh, ovarian cancer and, and particularly a, a particular subtype of ovarian cancer called a mucinous uh, ovarian cancer. Um, this is Albert Wharton, he was the first gentleman who, who published a paper in 1893 on it and this is a Lynch syndrome family from that paper. Um, multiple cases of colorectal cancer and gastric cancer and um, well it's actually it's gastric cancer and endometrial cancer that uh, follow a, 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 a very strong pattern and the, the Lynch syndrome gene wasn't identified for this family until the early 1990s. Um, Lynch, the difference with patients who refer to us for Lynch syndrome is that patients with Lynch syndrome, their tumors have characteristic patterns. They have unique features that we can test for. So if those features for Lynch syndrome are there in the tumor, well then we can talk about gene genetic testing. But if those features are not there, well there's no point in considering because it's very unlikely to be Lynch syndrome. So one of, the, one of the signatures is microsatellite instability. And there's, other, there's another staining technique. So we know Lynch syndrome was caused by four genes that make four proteins. So we can stain um, a patient's either their colorectal cancer or endometrial cancer. So if one or two of those proteins are missing on the stain, it points the finger at the gene that makes those proteins. So it helps us in our genetic investigations. Um, as I said, it's the family tree will tell us whether um, there's a predisposition for, for cancer in the family. The genetic test may not always confirm it, but Dr. Galler and I again, we saw a 34-year-old woman um, just back from honeymoon and was diagnosed with um, ovarian cancer and then had to have her ovaries removed at 34. Um, and I said, definitely this is Lynch syndrome, but the genetic testing has come back negative. And the reason I can say it is, is if you look at this lady's um, mother, grandmother, her great grandmother there, who had cancer of the womb. I'll go back one. She's that. That's her there, at the top right of uh, this family tree. So as you can see, the genetic testing so far has come back negative, but there that is a hereditary Lynch syndrome family. Um, so the difficulty, if you don't find a mutation, well, that's certainly the strongest family I've ever seen. So you have, un the unfortunate thing is, well, you have to presume everyone shares that risk until at some point that the genetic testing comes back and you can identify a mutation. Um, in terms of future developments, in terms of Lynch syndrome, there's a German group, Matthias Chlor and Magnus von Liebel Dubritz are looking at developing a vaccine for Lynch syndrome. Uh, and also Sir John Burns in the University of Newcastle is doing, has got some very good evidence to suggest that patients with Lynch syndrome who take aspirin really reduces the risk of um, uh, developing cancer. And the, you know, I, I think it's, it's hopefully, it's, it's likely that in, in going forward um, that patients with Lynch syndrome may be advised to take an aspirin once a day to reduce the risk of developing polyps and reduce the risk of developing cancer. Um, in terms of what is changing in the last 20 years, when I start, first started working with Professor Daly, we'd see a patient, we'd draw the family tree, we'd see, well, what's the pattern look like? And it was closer to BRC1 or 2. 
um, you test for those genes, you wait about six months for a result. If it came back negative, well, you'd look again. If, if there's another gene you could test for, well, you'd take another blood sample, send it off, probably wait a, nine months for another result. Um, but now there's next generation sequencing testing, which is a fancy way of saying that a person can give a blood sample and you can test for about 21 genes that are associated with increased cancer risk. Now, there is benefits to that, there's also drawbacks, but uh, some of the genes we know a lot about, there's others we, not really, we don't know enough about clinically at the moment, but if there's three outcomes of testing, you, it's going to be positive, it's going to be negative, or it's going to be uncertain. If you're testing for 21 different genes or more, you increase your, you increase your chances that you're going to get an uncertain result in genes that we don't know an awful lot about, but certainly it's the way this area is go this the cancer genetic area is going. And to conclude, only a small proportion of gynecological cancers attributed to dominant genes conferring high risk. The benefit we would say is that if there's a gene in the family, it allows us to see well who shares the risk and needs to be screened and who doesn't and can take a step back. And as I said, these newer platforms, the genetic platforms are offering potential benefits and risks as well. Um, there are genetic clinics in St. James Hospital in the National Center for Medical Genetics, whole genetic uh, clinics and satellite clinics in, um, in Cork and Galway. And also we have a clinic in the Matter Public. And I have to mention uh, Pat Fahey, who has developed the Lynch and Ireland website, is very, very good. And uh, I've done a little bit of uh, work um, for Pat, and uh, it's, 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 it's a very good reference for, for Lynch syndrome. And uh, I'll be around later on if anyone has any questions or concerns. Uh, thanks very much again for your time. <laughs>